Hello, everybody. This is Craig Moss. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of, for the Center for Responsible Enterprise and Trade, create.org. And I'm here today to discuss with you uh, issues related to protecting intellectual property and supply chains and some of the new European Commission initiatives. With me today, I'd like to introduce our other speakers. I will hand it over to Jean and Stephanie to introduce themselves and give a little bit of background on themselves and their organization. We really appreciate all of you joining. And um, just as a reminder, you can use the chat feature to send us questions because we will have a question session at the end of the presentation. Thanks very much. Uh, Jean, Stephanie, please go ahead and introduce yourselves. All right, well, to you, good morning, Craig, and, and to people listening in. Uh, my name is Jean Bergevin. I'm the head of unit uh, responsible for IPR enforcement in the European Commission in Brussels. Um, and uh, Stephanie works for me. I'll just pass her over to you. Hi, <clears throat> Hi everyone. I'm Stephanie Martin. I'm an IP lawyer, and I work uh, in Jean's unit as a policy officer. I am a national expert, and I was seconded by the French National Center for Scientific Research. So today what we're going to cover is we're going to take a look at some of the new initiatives that the European Commission has underway. We're then going to also look at some of the issues related to identifying and assessing risks related to IP. And we want to start to get all of you thinking along the lines of, how do you integrate IP protection into some of the existing supply chain responsibility programs that you have in place? And finally, we want to extend that and extend the thinking because IP protection is critical not only in your organization, but it's a critical component of how you work with third parties, whether they be suppliers, channel partners, or other types of organizations. I'm going to lead off and I'm going to just going to give a really quick introduction to some of the challenges that we see. CREATE is an organization that, that is a not-for-profit that focuses on helping to protect intellectual property or prevent corruption in the global uh, supply chain. We have been doing a lot of work in many, many countries around the world and really across a lot of different industries. And I'm going to quickly give a little context for this by talking to you about some of the challenges that we see. And then I'm going to hand it back over to Jean and Stephanie. So number one, depending on the group that I'm speaking to, often I'm speaking to supply chain professionals, and they really have a limited understanding of even what intellectual property is. So I'm going to very, very quickly hit on this. If we have a lot of lawyers in the group, I apologize for the simplicity of this. But there's really five types of intellectual property, and you can see them across the top. Trademarks, design rights, copyrights, patents, and trade secrets. There's a lot of growing interest in the trade secret issue. And in fact, CREATE has developed a more specialized service that really focuses on how do companies protect trade secrets and confidential information. As along the bottom, you see some examples of the different uh, types of IP. One of the things I want to highlight for you in the audience, though, is that what we find is that most companies tend to focus on one or two types of IP, and they think that that's really the core thing that they have to pay attention to. If it's an apparel company, it might be uh, trademarks. If it's an entertainment or software company, they might focus on copyrights. But what we find in the supply chain is that you really have to have a much broader perspective. You really have to be able to understand that your company is involved with all of these types of information. If you're contracting production to a third party, you might be authorizing them to use your trademark or maybe use your patents in producing that product, but you're very likely also transferring trade secrets and process know-how to that company. And these are all things that are critical for you to understand how to protect in an effective manner. A quick example here, and I happen to pick fashion and lifestyle, but we have uh, similar examples on automotive, electronics, food and beverage. It really goes across all industries. So 
in a real world, what are the things that we see and that companies talk to us a lot about as problems? Well, number one is counterfeits and ex excess production, or what's sometimes called the third shift. And a lot of times this is coming out of authorized production facilities. So the factory is contracted to make 100,000, they make 120,000. And I've been in meetings with factory owners in Asia where they explicitly tell me that that is what they're going to have to do in order to take the order from the Western buyer because the price demands were so extreme. So that's one issue. Another thing that we see quite often is prototypes or product designs being shared prematurely. A lot of this is sloppy management. A factory owner might be so excited to be getting an order from a famous European or American company that they're showing the prototype to every other potential customer and everybody that they know. That is just poor management. It's not intentional infringement. Unauthorized use of subcontractors is really a critical issue that spans many, many fields or issues with the responsible supply chain. It's routinely a labor issue, it's an environmental infringement issue, and it's very much an IP protection issue. Improper use and disposal of tooling. <clears throat> what happens when the tooling is done? You place an order for a million units, that production is ended, what happens to that tooling? And too often, it's not properly returned or, had, or disposed of in a certified way, and you find that the, either that factory is using it to produce additional product, which is an IP infringement, or they're selling it. There's a big secondary market for tooling among different factory groups in different areas of the world. And finally, as we mentioned before, theft of trade secrets, plans, designs. And not always is it theft intentional. I would like to also say that quite often here, we see poor management. And we've been in situations where doing a factory tour with a company, we're looking at uh, coming in with a prospective customer to a factory, and the factory is graciously hosting us, and we're touring the facility. And as we're walking around, we see drawings and prototypes and parts from competing products, from the products of competitors. That's sloppy. It's just poor management by the, on the part of that factory. Those are some of the issues that we see on a routine basis. One final thing here, that just to highlight on this, is that counterfeits can end up in legitimate final goods. And there was a case here with Austin Martin where they had to recall almost 18,000 cars because one of the plastic component parts in it was made from plastic that was counterfeit. They were, not, they were supposed to be using DuPont plastic that met a certain specification, and they were not. And that part was failing, and that caused the recall of 18,000 cars. So here again, what you need to think about is intent. Was that an intentional decision by the subcontractor, or was it poor management? If it, within that subcontractor, did everybody know? Is it only a small group of people that knew that was happening? Or were they completely oblivious because the real counterfeiting was taking place at the supplier of the plastics level? This is where we're going to talk later about management systems. This is where management systems and controls come in to try to be able to tighten these things up and try to be able to isolate rogue behavior from, from poor management practices. And before I hand it over to Jean and Stephanie, I just wanted to kind of wrap this, end, this early portion up with the idea that think about counterfeits entering legitimate supply chains. And we all know that there's purely illegitimate supply chains. You know, criminal factories that are producing goods for sale through uh, websites that are unauthorized. That is not really what Create focuses on. Specifically, what we're looking at is how do you start to minimize the counterfeits in the legitimate supply chains? And it happens with suppliers. We mentioned about the excess production. We saw an example of mixing in counterfeit parts, selling tooling on the secondary market. All of these things are situations. Suppliers often will over-order 
raw materials. And with those excess raw materials, they're producing goods in excess of what they're contracted to. That is an IP infringement. On the, on the distribution side, we've seen cases where distributors are knowingly buying counterfeits to increase their margins. It's really, a, and again, when you look at that, is it something that is being done by top management? Or is it something being done by an, a certain department inside that distributor in order to try to improve the performance of that department? These are things that become important for you as an organization to understand. And one of the ways that management systems and the use of tighter controls can really help to try to reduce this type of situation in the supply chain. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my good friends in, at uh, the EC, Jean and Stephanie. Please uh, take it away from here. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Craig. Well, <clears throat> let me just give you a general introduction of why we get involved with this. Um, so first of all, not to scare everybody off, yes, we are regulators. Um, but um, more generally, our task is really to try and fight uh, counterfeiting and piracy uh, in general. So we're as interested in, let's say, uh, soft law measures, good practices, et cetera, which prevent uh, counterfeits from coming onto the market as we are with the final redress, which is, for example, uh, litigation, taking people to court here in Europe, et cetera. And uh, back in 2014, uh, we came out with a, a, an action plan on enforcement of IPRs. Um, all these texts, by the way, are available. But, but just to, to focus, we, we really try to change the narrative, I would say, from our enforcement policy from one of repression to one of more, uh, joining what Craig said, a holistic approach, getting uh, everybody involved in uh, the business, not just the rights holders, um, but all the different intermediaries, both upstream and downstream, uh, to try and reduce the incentives on the possibilities, if you like, for the, the illicit players that Greg, Craig referred to, to basically uh, enter markets and cause the economic harm that we all know they do. So there were 10 uh, actions uh, which we listed in this uh, action plan. And the two that are really that, that we'll talk a little bit about to you today and which are key and very much the subject of the, uh, the subject are, first of all, action two, which was on this, the whole issue of the integrity of supply chains, because clearly we are aware. I mean, it can't be measured very effectively, but this is uh, through just, uh, it's not just anecdotal experience. I think, I mean, uh, rights holders themselves recognize it that counterfeits do come through in, as um, uh, Craig was saying, in licit supply chains. And as he also said, it's not necessarily uh, done purposefully. It can be through uh, lack of control or management error. Um, but nevertheless, those, the, you know, if we could reduce that possibility, that clearly helps everybody. And it should be a win-win situation. And the second action that we'll talk a little about is what we talk about, follow the money. The whole, the whole essence of our policy is to really uh, ensure that we get to, when we, you know, that we target our enforcement policy to those infringers who are in it for business. So to put it very simply, for those of you who might be interested in piracy, we're, we're really, it's not that we're not interested uh, about kids in their bedrooms, let's put it that way, but that's not where the big money is made. We're, we're more interested in the uh, illicit operators who are either making a lot of money from uh, promoting uh, counterfeits or, or pirated material uh, or indeed selling it uh, directly. So uh, that's when we talk about follow the money. It's really to focus on commercial scale infringement, um, and which, of course, is the one that causes the most economic harm. So that was the... Um, uh, the general outline. Just, just uh, before we get to, to the going into the integrity of the supply chains, just one point that I would say: we also 
the new commission, thanks Craig, was he's operating this, so thanks a lot. Um, we, the, the new commission came, adopted um, a single market strategy last uh, October where we have said that this is one of the priority actions uh, for this commission. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean we're going to regulate it? No. We are currently consulting. Uh, we have a public consultation out uh, on the issue, particularly of supply chains. Um, and indeed, you're very welcome to contribute to that, whether you're in Europe or not. I think, I mean, many, uh, if, if you're listening to us from the U.S., clearly you, many of you, uh, supply the EU market, so we're really interested in having your views as much as uh, EU-based firms. Um, and we're trying to see what the best practice is and trying to see how uh, we could facilitate, if you like, better due diligence in supply chain. So it's not a, a regulatory approach, it's more seeing all the different possibilities out there and, if you like, facilitating uh, best practice in, in these areas. Um, so again, it's being put up um, in this uh, uh, communication which came out in October 2015. So it's really uh, a key initiative for this uh, commission and we hope um, to come forward with there be a major conference on this in Brussels, which I announced now on the 21st of June, uh, where already we'll take a stock take and the results of our public consultation. Thanks, Craig. Can we go to the... There we go. So I'll pass you over to Stephanie now. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Craig. Uh, could you move forward, please? Thank you. So um, first, I just want to explain very briefly what the problem is. I think most of you understood that we are facing a problem of vulnerability of global supply chains. The reason is because supply chains are very complex. There are a lot of actors, a lot of intermediaries that are involved, and therefore companies are facing a transparency issue. And of course, infringers take advantage of this vulnerability and of this lack of transparency. Next slide. So uh, we would like to promote a holistic approach, which is based on due diligence. When we speak about due diligence, we mean supply chain integrity, but we also think of track and trace technologies in view of better protecting IP in supply chains. So how do we achieve supply chain integrity? We think it's very important to uh, develop a culture of transparency, a culture of responsibility and fairness through the supply chain. But in order to do so, um, it's important to implement best practices. And very interestingly, uh, we, when talking with stakeholders, we realized that a lot of best practices already exist. They are out there. They are used for all, all the types of, of risks, for all the types of violations, but unfortunately, they are not applied to IP. Some of those practices which we find interesting are, for example, corporate social responsibility practices. Um, respon CSR, corporate social responsibility, uses systems such as audits, codes of conduct, labels, and so on. And we think that if those practices were applied to IP, it could be very beneficial for right holders and for IP enforcement. But, of course, if we want this to work, it's very important to involve all the actors in the supply chain. Right holders need to cooperate with their suppliers, they need to know who their suppliers are, and suppliers need to communicate with their, with their with right holders. So it's a cooperation all throughout the supply chain. The other aspect of due diligence that we want to focus on is the use of track and trace technology. We would like companies to cooperate with security companies, standards organizations in order to develop cost-effective technological tools for due diligence. Those tools would be 
would aim, would allow authorities and consumers to have information about the product, for example, on, about the authenticity and the integrity of the product. We know, for example, that a lot of, um, a lot of uh, companies already develop such technologies. Uh, you, as a consumer, you can, for example, with your, uh, with your smartphone, you can scan a, a product and you have information about the product. So we would like this to be further developed in order to have more information about the product and, about, and in order to make sure that the consumer knows exactly what he is buying. <coughs> We have different options, and like Jean explained, we are not looking, we do not want to go for compulsory measures. We were thinking about having, developing a scheme with non-legislative measures and based on good practices, voluntary good practices. But instead, we're thinking more about developing a scheme which we call Voluntary Plus. It's a sort of, uh, premium package of voluntary measures because we still want to encourage and promote good practices like I just said. But at the same time, since we are in the process of reviewing the IPR enforcement directive, we also want to see how due diligence can be addressed in the context of this review and how we can try to find incentives for companies to develop and use due diligence as a as a scheme. So our conclusion is that due diligence is a win-win strategy for everyone, for right holders, because it can help have better enforcement, more effective enforcement, because due diligence is not about having a reactive approach, but rather about having a preventive approach. It's also a win-win strategy for consumers who can have information about the products that they, can, that they buy. It's about building trust for consumers about the products. It's also a win-win strategy for suppliers because when you have transparency in the supply chain, when you have a responsible supply chain, it means that you help to promote fair business practices, which is, of course, beneficial for suppliers themselves. More broadly, we think that this kind of strategy is good in general for other aspects because it helps to promote environmental and social standards. Having responsible supply chains has an impact at all levels, not just in terms of IP. So the next step, um, we organized a workshop in June last year, and it was a very interesting workshop and I'm not saying this because the Commission organized the workshop, but because we had experts from different sectors, it was uh, a wide range of stakeholders. We had people from NGOs, consumers associations, we had large companies, SMEs, researchers. We had a representative of the OECD as well as a representative of a standard organization. Following this workshop, we started working on a survey and we published the survey in December. This is an online consultation. It's available for everyone, and we encourage everyone, including SMEs, to contribute to the survey. The survey will run until the 6th, 6th of April this year at midnight. We are also thinking about uh, adopting a communication in 2017. Uh, for the moment, we cannot say too much information about this. We will see how it goes. Uh, uh, in the next coming months. And like I explained, uh, we are currently working on the review of the IPR enforcement and we will see how and whether due diligence can be addressed in the context of this revision. So now I will briefly present Follow the Money. So the purpose of this strategy is to disrupt the flow of revenues of uh, infringing activities. What is important about this strategy is that we want to involve intermediaries in IPR enforcement. And when we talk about intermediaries, we refer to online intermediaries as well as offline intermediaries. We also want 
intermediaries and right holders to cooperate together and to work on MOUs, Memoranda of Understanding, in order to find, develop, and let's say, in order to formalize, I don't know if you can say this in English, but to make formal their agreements in terms of good practices to prevent that infringers m make profits with their infringing activities. We also want to uh, promote national activities, uh, initiatives, sorry, in the EU. So we are aware of uh, initiatives related to follow the money in France, the UK, or Italy. So we also want to promote these initiatives. Regarding the online, the digital environment, we started working with the advertising sector. As you know, advertising online is a major source of revenues for IP infringing sites. What happens is that some ads, which are ads for listed products, are misplaced and they automatically end up on illicit websites. So this, this is a real problem for brands because it, it damages their, their, their image and it's also a problem in terms of consumer point of view because it just breaks the trust of consumer for, for the brand. We are also starting to uh, initiate a dialogue between right holders and, right holders and uh, payment service providers because payment services are also used by IP infringers. So we want to, we would like right holders and payment processors to work together on finding good practices to limit, to reduce those kind of uh, problems. And more recently, we started the dialogue with shippers and express carriers we are in the process, we are organizing a conference which will be held on the 20th of April with shippers and express carriers. We are just in the beginning of the process, so I cannot say much about it, but uh, the idea is to gather shippers, express carriers, advertisers, and payment processors in the conference that will be taking place in June. And now what about the other intermediaries? There are other intermediaries such as retailers and wholesalers. We are thinking about also extending uh, MOUs to those intermediaries and we will see in the future how this goes. And we will, of course, take you, keep you updated about this. That's all. You can have the floor, Craig. Uh, thanks, John and Stephanie. Um, what we're going to do now is that we're going to go into a little bit of background on integrating IP protection into the responsible supply chain, really following up on, on what Jean and Stephanie talked about in that due diligence category, and the idea of building a culture of IP protection and looking at ways that that can actually be integrated into responsible supply chain. So, and then we're going to bring Jean and Stephanie back on to uh, address some of the specific questions that <clears throat> have been coming in. So i like to lead this off with a quote from Stanford Business School and some research that they did a couple years ago. And I actually presented this, part of this at the uh, session that, that Jean and Stephanie held in Brussels last, last summer. The idea that, that uh, Stanford found is that Companies will benefit from aligning their IP protection strategy with those associated with improved social and environmental performance. Most fundamentally, it's establishing management systems. And we're going to go into a little bit of more detail on that so you know what that is specifically. But if you think about it, multinationals all have pretty sophisticated responsible supply chain programs. They might call it their CSR program. There's a number of different names. But they're using mechanisms to try to understand the social and environmental practices at third parties. We can use those same mechanisms to understand the IP protection practices at third parties. And that's where we're so excited to be working with the EC because we really share a similar philosophy around this 
that it has to become practical and it has to become something that companies can implement in an effective way. This is just something I'm going to uh, hit on quickly, but here is a publicly traded global manufacturer discovered that their largest authorized distributor was selling 20% counterfeit goods. They were getting returns, product failures. They dug into it and they realized that it was counterfeits coming through a big authorized distributor. They did not want to bring it public because that would hurt their stock value, create a lack of trust in the investment community, and show really that they had poor controls. So what they did instead is initiated a global program to improve the controls at all distributors to eliminate counterfeits from flowing into legitimate distributors. Within 18 months, the problem had largely been solved without making it a public announcement and without alienating the relationship or destroying the business relationship with their largest distributor. So here's just a quick example of where these things can be done in a way that is a win-win from the business side also within that third-party relationship. So what happens now with IP protection? Typically it tends to be more of a legal approach or in the case of counterfeits, brand protection actions with enforcement approaches. These of course are critical and we never, would never suggest that they are not an important component, but what we are saying is that they tend to end up <clears throat> siloing it in the legal department of a company, and over time they tend to become reactive. What IP protection needs in the supply chain is something that becomes more preventative and proactive. Going back to some of the things that Jean and Stephanie said, how do you create that culture you don't create culture through reactive behavior. You create a positive culture through preventative and proactive messaging. And a management system helps to be able to clarify that. What are the expectations of a third party? What are the expectations of the people in your own company? I was talking with a company recently that was sending engineers from the United States to China working with contract manufacturers there. Those engineers could not identify with 100% accuracy what their own company considered trade secrets. Think about that. You're sending people out to deal with, and they don't even know what you classify as a trade secret. These are all control and system type issues. And finally, as, as we mentioned, and, and as John and Stephanie mentioned, companies are doing responsible supply chain programs. And if you look at sophisticated supply chain, responsible supply chain programs, they're all built around management systems and employee engagement are really the two fundamental pieces. The audit becomes a data collection mechanism, but the thing that drives improvement is management systems and employee engagement. So what I'm going to do quickly now is just walk you through the parts of it. So that if you, somebody asked you, well, what is a management system consist of? There's really eight pieces. And I'm going to hit on these real quickly so we have time for questions later. But number one, of course, policies, procedures, and records. Critical piece. Most companies stop after they get to the policy stage. Procedures are those instructions that people need to know how to follow the policy. And then, of course, the records. What proof do you have that people are following it? And not only in your company, but with your third parties. If you're licensing production to a third party, what records do they keep to show that your IP is well protected there? Next, cross-functional team. Critical component. Successful implementation really requires cross-functional input. You can't have it siloed in legal, you really need to get input from the various functional areas because the idea is to embed IP protection in how the company operates. Just as the same way that other responsible supply chain initiatives are trying to become more embedded in operations. Risk assessment, critical piece here. And at a most fundamental level, what is the company doing to even identify their most important IP and assess the risk. Now in the CREATE program, 
we evaluate companies on a maturity scale of one to five in all of these categories. And I'll give you a quick uh, intro to that in a second. But be thinking about maturity level here is what is a, a basic level risk assessment? What does a more mature one look like? And at a more mature level, you might be starting to think about the severity or probability of negative events. And for any of you familiar with the UN guiding principles and their whole uh, push toward corporate responsibility in the supply chain and whether companies have caused, contributed to, or are linked to negative events, it's all built around risk assessment and severity and probability of those negative events happening and then taking appropriate action. That same philosophy can be used for IP protection. Management of supply chain. This is kind of a classic third party uh, category where we think about what are the contracts? What kind of due diligence do we do on a third party before entering into a contract are really the pieces that go here. Training and capacity building is pretty straightforward, but if you don't have a training program or if your supplier isn't training people, no matter what the policies are, they're probably not being followed on a consistent basis. Monitoring is the area that we see the biggest weakness globally. Companies tend not to monitor the IP protection components of the relationships in the supply chain. Aside from the brand protection, which tends to be a more after-the-fact type of situation. What we're encouraging is more proactive monitoring that's tied to the contractual provisions, that's tied to the code of conduct, so to speak, or the expectations that you communicate to that third party. Corrective action is, is very simply looking at what happens when a problem is found. And if we look too often in, in supply chain compliance, the, the number one issue that people will do or the, the thing they'll try to do is to hide the problem, which of course is the worst thing that we want to happen. The less likely or less common, but, but number two on the list would be that they try to put a Band-Aid on the problem. So the bleeding stops or they try to put the fire out or whatever the case would be. But a more mature response is root cause analysis. Why did the problem happen? What do we need to change in the system to keep it from happening again? And regardless of whether it's quality management or labor compliance or environmental compliance or IP protection or anti-corruption prevention, corrective action and system improvement is what starts to get the idea of continual improvement together. And finally for IP and for trade secret protection would be security and confidentiality management both IT security, but also the physical security of the facilities. So these are all the components of an IP protection management system. If we look at these, they're very, very similar to the elements of a social or environmental compliance management system. So there's a lot of overlap there. What we do at CREATE in our program and working with companies is we start off with an online assessment so companies can answer a series of questions and get a maturity score on a scale of one to five. We then follow that up with an independent evaluation where we interview uh, one or more people at the company. We review documents, policies, training manuals, monitoring protocols, things like that to really get a sense of the maturity and generate a second maturity score. And then finally, we produce improvement plans for companies to help them prioritize what things they could do to reduce risk, either internally or with the third parties they deal with. And part of this, again, in the supply chain is you always need to think about cascading. How do you cascade it from your level to your tier ones to your tier twos? Going back to the Austin Martin situation, the real problem there could have been at the plastic supplier, not at the molding company. That's why that kind of cascading is so important. And then finally, it creates, we have a guide and we have a series of services and workshops and advisory services that we run to try to help companies improve because our whole philosophy is to measure and improve. That's what people need to do in terms of IP protection. 
one final slide here for me, and then we're going to turn it back over and open it up for questions, is what are some of the top tips? And, and Jean and Stephanie talked about integrating this into responsible supply chain. And some of these things are very aligned. So number one is how do you gain transparency into that supply chain? That's been a huge challenge for labor and environmental compliance, is getting that transparency. And then how do you get credible information? That's an important piece to it. And one of the mechanisms there we think is, is going toward this kind of management system maturity approach does start to give you credible information on which companies are best equipped to manage their own IP protection program. So number two here would be to build on existing in investments in responsible supply chain. As I mentioned before, we're working with some multinationals that have very sophisticated responsible supply chain programs at this point with um, hundreds or even thousands of audits being conducted each year, with trained staff that is going in to follow up on audits and helping facilities with corrective actions and remediation plans. All of that our infrastructure can be used to also support IP protection. And I think that that really links back into what Jean and Stephanie are talking about of, of more, sort of a more holistic approach. We talked before about management systems, and then how do you extend this to third parties? There's some very easy mechanisms to extend your systems to third parties. Communicate the importance of IP protection. Take a look at your supplier code of conduct and see if it even mentions IP protection. That's an easy addition. Go in, get in touch with us. We have model IP policies you can use and pick and choose some of the pieces that could go into that supplier code of conduct. We need to start elevating the culture around this and having it be included. And finally, a very specific thing, <clears throat> is look in your organizations to see who is routinely visiting the third parties. It might be you might have quality control people. You might have marketing people that are going to uh, channel partners. Look to see who's visiting and give them some very basic red flag training on identifying IP protection issues. Just the simplest things, the top five red flags. You tie red flag training into inclusion of IP in your code of conduct, and you're starting to make headway. You're starting to integrate IP protection into the responsible supply chain in a very cost-effective and scalable way. So with that, I'd like to uh, really end, and we have we, quite nice, we have some good time for questions here, and I've seen that some questions have already come in. So I think we're now going to turn it back over to questions. Um, first, Jean or Stephanie, any other follow-up thoughts that you have that you would just like to uh, go forth with before we start answering specific questions? Yeah, thanks, Craig. Just one point as well, because obviously when we talk about these issues, and many of the people listening in today are uh, working for multinationals, et cetera. But our idea is to uh, promote this as broadly as possible uh, to all the business community. And, um, you know, we're very keen also to have systems because, as, as you said, it, 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 it is often a case of building in an IP logic uh, into existing auditing or, if you like, customer or client relationships. And uh, if we can promote that very broadly, that means also it should be a win-win for everybody. And, and the SMEs in particular and small suppliers will see the interest for them to uh, account for IP or apply due diligence for IP because they're, they're, um, their customers, who may be your groups, will obviously be looking for that. So it's by doing this making this a policy statement if you like and promoting it broadly um we really want to uh if you like have a very powerful multiplier effect 
uh, at all levels in, in business to, to, to start thinking about this logic. And, and as you've said, and, and I think you've explained it very clearly, you know, we, we really do think in the end business, and we understand that, will only do this if it really helps their bottom line. And uh, as, as you've explained, we don't think it's that costly to do it. I think that there are existing systems there which are used uh, for other uh, policy or rather strategic purposes. It's just as you said that very often we find, and this is no disrespect to any lawyers on the line uh, or from in-house lawyers, that very often IP is seen, uh, it's obviously often in the compliance department of companies, um, and de facto, it is seen as a, 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 they have reactive policies against IP infringement. The whole point here is to get, in addition, of course, you will always have to have that reactive policy, but to, to get a proactive uh, positioning of IP, to see it as uh, a, an essential asset, which is worthy of uh, due diligence you know, throughout the different departments. As you mentioned, it can be marketing, it can be... Uh, obviously supplies etc so ju just to say that the idea is very broad and another point is, as, as um, Stephanie and I have repeated we're not here to say we want to regulate all this but you need flexibility there, there will be different systems will be amenable to different companies and, and the issues will be different depending on which sectors uh, you apply it uh, nevertheless when we are as she said we are reviewing um, also, our, um, the, the whole issue of uh, civil redress here in Europe, um, and it's it's very interesting because some people say, oh yes, but uh, you know, is this really necessary, etc. Well, already today, uh, an intermediary defined non-defined, so that could be any intermediary, upstream or downstream, can be um, uh, basically injuncted. Um, if uh, he's in some way not assisting but contributing to uh, an IP infringement. And, and that's always useful, I think, when you're talking to suppliers or whatever to remind them of that because, um, you know, that, that, that stick, if you like, can, let's just say, help the negotiation in those uh, tricky moments. And maybe in our um, revision we can clarify that further. Again, the idea is not to be repressive. It's just to to basically say, look, this is good business practice. And, and as much as uh, you, the client, well, the supplier too should benefit from this. He will be a trusted supplier because he, he's accounting for, for this importance. So I, I was saying too, but one last point, trade secrets. Craig's mentioned this. We, we've recently, or we're about to adopt a, um, a directive here in Europe again, to, we hope, to, to facilitate redress against trade secret theft. That's, that's of course, at the, the end of the process. You want to avoid that. But I can only echo what Craig um, said about how companies right now, I mean, trade secret theft, if, if you're not aware of this, is literally exploding, um, uh, as is, by the way, counterfeiting. There'll be um, uh, a report due out in mid-April from the OECD showing that the the, the value and levels of counterfeiting have, have again, unfortunately, but really substantially increased since the last time they looked at it uh, about six years ago. Um, but, the, but the key issue with trade secret theft is, is very often it's exactly what Craig was saying, is that the company uh, personnel who are working with suppliers are not always, let's say, as diligent as they should be, largely because from a management point of view they haven't asked to be or they haven't even been told of what is the key trade secrets or the core secrets of the company when talking to suppliers. And very often, that once you've done that, you've lost, uh, not only have you lost your trade secret, but you could lose your market completely. So, so it's very important to stress that it's not, an, it's not an intellectual property right, but it is a form of intellectual property, which is very, very important in any business, any business, whatever the size. Um, and managing your trade secrets is, is absolutely central to what we've been talking about. That's all I have to say at this point, Craig. Okay. Um, we have a couple questions that have come in so far. Um, I'll hand this. This is clearly one for you and Stephanie. Do you know whether the EU CORE will address this topic? And CORE is all caps, C-O-R-E. 
Is there a core that. project in, underway in the EU? I'm not sure what that means, actually, by core. No. I, what I, what I, I mean, uh, what, what I can tell you is that the, <laughs> the EU as far, I mean, we as the Commission will be proposing this, and it will be, it, it's been discussed. I mean, if uh, it, it's already been raised and discussed in the European Parliament and with the ministers of the member states responsible. That, that's, uh, for us, that's the core deciding factor, but I don't, I don't really mean what EU core means. We're trying to find out. I'll try and find out. Yeah, there's and something they, they mentioned. European in cooperation in research and education. I think that's uh, what um, uh, people are saying that maybe they're looking at it. I think this is um, the, this is not one of our uh, research uh, areas, and we are. Um, this is linked to what we call the Europe 2020 uh, research programs. What you need to know is that certainly DG, the DG responsible for that, which is DC, DG Research uh, and Technology and Development, we work with them. And in fact, S Stephanie in her presentation mentioned we were looking at all forms of technical tools, and that's all they are. They're technical tools that could assist in, uh, uh, you know, in not so much tracking, but actually in putting in what you were saying, uh, Craig, of uh, allowing you to get the data, if you like, to have the signals to see where there are problems. And with our joint research center, which is linked to DGRTD, so which is linked to all these programs, we've done a, uh, they did a mapping or are still doing a, a mapping of all the different technologies available uh, that can be used for these purposes. Again, the idea is not to say, okay, you should, you know, impose one or other techn technical solution but more to make available and, and, and promote all the different kinds of technologies and the, the suppliers in that market that, that can be of use for this purpose. Fantastic. Um, and here's a follow-up question. Uh, quite a really interesting question is the, the person is saying that, that the idea of adding uh, new skill sets to auditors and employees that are working on responsible supply chain is really helps, it really broadens them and that it might be a challenge for them is the way I'm interpreting this. And she's asking if there are examples. She said companies are already struggling with checking implementation of UN guiding principles. They're already struggling with social and environmental compliance in their supply chain. Yeah. And are there examples of companies that have phased IP into their supplier codes of conduct? Um, well, I'll go Sorry. from your. I'll let you go from your side, uh, Jean and Stephanie, and then I can respond also. Uh, well, yes, there there are examples. Uh, when we started working the project, we did some research about um, you know about uh, sustainability reports uh, that are produced and issued by companies, and we found actually some reports were which were issued by multinational companies, who integrate into uh, their system IP. Because something that you need to know is, um, according to the norm, to the ISO 26000 norm, IP, the protection of IP and the fight against counterfeiting is part of having an ethical and responsible business conduct. And some companies do, um, do address this issue as part of their responsible, res their CSR strategy. So yes, there are examples. We also see examples here in the U.S. and companies that we've worked with, um, both specifically in the responsible supply chain programs uh, with IP being added into supplier code of conduct, but also the broader enterprise risk management. We see a trend toward enterprise risk management groups really starting to look at supply chain as a key element, and then within that, they're looking at the labor, environmental, corruption, and IP protection as all different types of, of supply chain risks. And IP is also really a, a direct internal risk as well as just a supply chain risk. Can I add something else, Craig? Because I, I think coming back to your, to your first question, because I think that's very much um, also aimed at, you know, auditors being trained to look at this, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I think I, I just, you, you may recall when we were have, holding this uh, workshop, which, which you kindly attended last summer, um, there are certainly some of the business schools 
um, are integrating, I think, into their training, uh, or certainly in terms of business management, but also for operations research, etc. Um, this logic. So I think that, yeah, there may be a short a shortage of that skill set at the moment, but I think that there are, you know, th th this issue is now becoming more mainstream. It's it's also becoming mainstream. I think, frankly. Yeah, sure. All this costs in the end. I can understand the question. The thing is that the costs of losing your IP can be very considerable as well. And I think there's a, the whole issue is, and we understand this, you know, companies will not invest in this unless there's a net benefit. But I think there's increasing evidence that, you know, there's certainly a net loss if you don't invest in it. Um, because it's all very well, you know, um, taking actions once you've lost your IP. But many people have said to us, for example, we, we in um, adopting this, this, this new uh, directive on trade secrets, on mis illicit misappropriation of trade secrets, um, many companies said to us, it's good to get it out there. It's not just because we want someday to be able to try and get redress in a court against the theft of trade secrets. It's far more because it actually allows us then, when we are negotiating with our suppliers to say, right, take this into account, uh, to again have this kind of stick approach mm -hmm. to, to encourage um, people to take this uh, you know, very seriously. And we heard that particularly from SMEs. Um, so, so I think that there's a, a net benefit, but certainly you know, talking to the professions, uh, including, of course, the accountancy um, and, and, and the questioner may well know this, the whole issue of valorization of IP and intangible assets is a really key issue these days, particularly in our knowledge economy where most assets are indeed intangible. Um, but certainly our, our, our attempt, or certainly what we're doing now, is talking to the academic community and um, you know, the business school community, and, and I think we're getting very, very positive echoes again in saying this should be an integral part of management training. I, I agree, and you know it's it's interesting because not only were uh, that Stanford Business School research that I, I cited before, but on on another practical level, Create has a collaboration with a global audit company called Intertech, and as part of that, we help to develop a field protocol, field audit protocol for IP protection that Intertech is starting to test to be able to add it either into their existing labor audits, their quality audits, or their CTPAT security audits. So it's definitely heading in that direction. And I think for companies now, starting to think that way puts you at the, sort of the uh, leading edge of the wave. I think it's going to continue to grow. But th there is that field audit protocol that we developed for, uh, with Intertech. It's going to be rolled out, uh, really it's being rolled out now, just starting to be rolled out now. Um, quick question. Uh, one of the things that came up is could you describe, you mentioned about Voluntary Plus as sort of that mid-level. From a company perspective, what would the implication of Voluntary Plus be for a company? Well, I think, I mean, the, the, the voluntary is what you do. <laughs> the, the, the plus is the, is the stick I was mentioning about. Not against you necessarily, but, you know, um, Putting, putting the spotlight on the actual situation in law today. The, the situation in law today is that an intermediary can be injuncted uh, for uh, a, an infringement of an IPR, um, and not because he's benefiting from it, simply because the infringement is a commercial scale, and he has to, uh, you know, he can be injuncted to stop uh, his his supply, etc., or and he can have quite significant. Uh, impact on his business or her business, of course. So the the stick, if you like, is is, is to show this. And the other thing that is is being accounted for is beginning to get accounted for, and you see this in some uh, court uh, reasoning, is that if uh, this is the other side, if the if if a rights holder, if you like, has not really uh, applied due diligence. In, in trying to prevent, you know, or take at least good business practice steps to prevent infringement, that may come into account when the judge evaluates what damages should be awarded to that right holder. 
Um, so the you know the the incentivization, if you like, of uh, investing uh, in this, for looking at what the uh, both the, um, <clears throat> the the well the potential legal implications are if you don't. Um, that is something which we see as the the stick element, if I can put it quite clearly, and that's that's what is already, frankly, in the law, and which we would clarify in the law. And and by the way, <clears throat> this shouldn't be seen as you know, you said uh, very rightly that, you know, very often, even if there is, um, you know, okay. intentional intent. That is it, please. Mm -hmm. oh. Okay. Hello? I just can't. Okay. Oh. Hello? Sorry, go ahead, John. Oh, sorry. If, if um, even if there is uh, intention to, to harm, you know, it may be against the right holder's interest to take a court action for the reasons you said, brand equity, hit on, on value, um, etc. So, so it, it comes down to this issue, nevertheless, that the rights holder being able to say that he can take action, etc., and, and, and being, being very clearly signaled that, uh, still, in our opinion, is in a better position uh, to negotiate these kinds of practices with their suppliers. It's not, and, and coming back to the voluntary approach, remember, it's everybody in the supply chain. <clears throat> it's not just you who, who entail the cost. I mean, the whole idea is you share the cost with your suppliers uh, and with your distributors or your, 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 your uh, channels, your different channels. Um, and by doing that, everybody wins. It's not a, uh, you know, only the rights holder has to do this and, and, and carry the can and the costs. It is basically that everybody in the chain is expected to do it. And from a legal point of view, that's called fair business practice. That's very much enshrined in fair competition law. And if you're not doing it, you're likely to, you know, you could certainly be, be sued for not doing so. I think that the idea of the carrot and the stick is, is really an, uh, the way that a lot of supply chain initiatives uh, take root, is that combination of carrot and stick. And one of the things that, that creates involved with, there's an organization in the U.S. Uh, in North America that is actually global called the Licensing Executive Society. And they tend to be a little more patent focused, but nonetheless, there's I think a thousand different member companies. and. I'm part of a working group to help to develop an IP protection in the supply chain standard, with their goal being that it ultimately could become some kind of ANSI standard. So there's another example of companies coming together and saying, we need to try to find some kind of voluntary mechanism to be able to elevate not only the performance, but also clarify the expectations in the supply chain and then help to elevate the performance to meet those expectations. Um, I, I know we've come to the end of our time. I don't know, Jean and Stephanie, if we had one other question come up. I don't sure. know if you have a minute to answer yeah, sure, one more sure, question. No, no problem. Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> the question that came up is, in terms of thinking forward, do you see any type of links between uh, these new the possible new directive and government procurement yeah. uh, initiatives in, the, in, the, in Europe? Well, I, I, I mean, it's, it's, uh, the question is very good, actually. Let me give you a, a little anecdote which will um, show to you how governments are thinking in this area. Um, when we first came out, you, you, you may recall when I started our presentation, I mentioned this action plan and that we had uh, 10 action points. One of those was actually to look at um, how procurement bodies, so in other words, member states, authorities, or, or, or local authorities, etc., uh, try, you know, um, apply whether they apply best practice in um, checking for counterfeits coming into their supply chains, if you like. And uh, it was very interesting because the first call, literally, I got on the day the thing came out was believe it or not, from the UK Ministry of Defence, who said, "Oh no, no, you've got to come. We have." Um, uh, we have a working group looking on this, on counterfeiting in supply chains. Um, and, and we are looking exactly at this at best practice with all the different suppliers coming into the, uh, into the defense uh, sector. Um, so 
let, let's be clear. I mean, I don't think that this is a, it won't need our directive to do it. I think that there are that certainly uh, here in Europe, the um, procurers are already trying to uh, build in to their uh, different contracts requirements on their uh, first tier, second tier suppliers, which fully account for the need to protect uh, IP. And, and that is quite remarkable. It shows again the scale of the problem. You know, we are talking about um, component parts going into pretty sophisticated kits, as, as the Brits were saying. And, and this was an issue here in Europe, at least. There were all the different uh, suppliers. We're talking across the, the aeronautic shipping uh, land uh, forces who are massive procurers, as, as you probably know, and we had all the different suppliers who were there, um, including representatives from the semiconductors industry, etc. So I think they too will be driving for this um, and looking, which is quite natural. I mean, obviously, when you think of that, but you can think also in medical supplies, um, you know, counterfeit uh, uh, or, or defective products coming through their supply chains and, and the implications that that has uh, for those uh, public services. So, so certainly the question is a very useful one, and there, all I can say is there's certainly interest already out there. I don't think we'll need to do a directive. I think you'll, you would probably find that in um, certain of those sectors they are already uh, requiring their suppliers um, to commit to these kinds of uh, practices that we've been talking about this this morning or this afternoon here. Fantastic. Um, Stephanie, anything you want to say to wrap up and then before I close out? Well, I just want to stress that, um, that this initiative also applies to SMEs and uh, we're not just addressing the issue for large companies. So that's the reason why we encourage SMEs to uh, participate and contribute to the, um, to the survey that we launched in December. Great. And, and for all of you that are, are on, um, we will be sending out the slides and links to the webinar. It has been recorded. Feel free to distribute it in your organization and in your supply chain. Let okay. people know what the kind of thinking is taking place around this. And as part of the email that we send out, again, we can also include, Stephanie, if you want, another link to the survey that the EC is conducting on issues related to IP in the supply chain. That would be perfect. Thanks a lot. Okay. So with that, I'm going to say thank you very much, John and Stephanie. It's been a pleasure as always. I could talk with you both for the rest of the afternoon, but okay. we have other people that need to get to doing that. They're getting back to their job. So, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you, Craig. Goodbye. Okay, to and thanks to everybody who attended. And uh, feel free to get in touch with us with any follow-up questions or if you need any more information. Thanks very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks again. Bye. Bye.